Just a trifle. Um, hello everybody. How are you tonight? I'm feeling good. I'm feeling fine. Okay, I got a good night's sleep. I see my, um, uh, I see one of my friends is on here, Greta, um, in Chile. Hi Greta. She says, I so wish we could have dinner and talk through all this. <laughs> I'm afraid we can't um, have dinner together for a while, Greta. But uh, we could have a virtual dinner and talk through all this. Okay, we could do it by conference call. Um, but... It would be easy for Bonnie and I to have our dinner here and for you to have your dinner there. And we could talk through it all. In fact, I think that would be fun. Hi, Dolores. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, um, um, hi, honey. I'm very glad to see you here. That is Bonnie, of course. Um, 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 Evelina says hello. Um, Avril Mano says 
borrowed a friend's device. I made it for once. Good evening, beautiful people. <laughs> Kay says, hi, all. Rick Maynard says, evening, all. Avril says, um, hi, a doll. <laughs> Kay says, hi, Avril. Greta says, hi, Joe. Hi again, Greta. And Jim Bird says, hello, MMT. Joe, the economic soldier. Yeah, you're going to be hearing some MMT tonight because we really need to hear about MMT tonight. And Russ says, um, um, evening, Dr. Joe. Hi, Russ. It's very good to see you here. Okay, I'm going to get started now. Okay, so I'm going to share the screen with the first of our articles. I have a lot of articles to go through tonight, so it's going to be like a fire hose and... I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on any one, I don't think. But I don't know, maybe I'll change my mind as I go through them. Anyway, the first one is called <laughs> Criminal Negligence. Trump officials ignored the company's offer to make 7 million N95 masks per month in the early days of the pandemic. So you know this federal scientist, his name is Rick um, Bright, and he's been fighting with Trump, and he was recently dismissed uh, from his job and reassigned um, 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 but to another, and he filed a whistleblower complaint uh, last week over his demotion following his criticism of the administration's response to the pandemic. He reports on detailed communications with Prestige Ameritech in January, in which HHS ignored the medical supply company's offer to produce um, um, N95 um, um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the respirator masks um, um, at the rate of 7 million per month per month <laughs> per month, sorry <laughs> and this is an American company it's Fort Worth based and Michael Bowen is the head of it and he wrote to HHS on January 23rd, two days after the U.S. confirmed its first case of COVID-19. Um, um, and he had four dormant production lines that were capable of producing 7 million um, N95 masks um, per month. But he was told by Laura Wolf, director of the Division of Critical Infrastructure Protection at HHS, I don't believe we as a government are anywhere near answering those questions for you yet. We are the last major domestic mass companies, said Bowen. And he said, quote, my phones are ringing now, so I don't need government business. I'm just letting you know that I can help you preserve our infrastructure if things ever get really bad. In Bright's complaint, he described how he tried to direct Assistant Secretary um, um, for Preparedness and Response, Robert um, Cadillac's attention to Bowen's offer in late uh, January. And Bowen wrote to Bright following his communications with Wolf that uh, the U.S. mass supply is at um, imminent risk. And he said to Rick, he said, Rick, quote, I think we're in deep shit, unquote. And Bright wanted to know from Cadillac why Bowen's offer had fallen on uh, um, um, deaf ears. And Rick still doesn't know why the country has been uh, reporting severe shortages of N95 masks, as well as other PPE needed to stop the spread of COVID-19 since that time. And the company's offer was never taken up. Right now, we need 7 million masks a month. Right now. It's May. It's not the end of January. We need 7 million masks 
um, um, per month. The government never ordered those masks. Never ordered those masks. Incompetence and cruelty. A number of people have already tweeted that, of course. On Friday, a federal probe found there were reasonable grounds to believe, unquote, that the Trump administration unlawfully retaliated against Bright by demoting him. So there it is, folks. That's the side issue, though. The most important issue is we could have had 7 million masks a month. 7 million masks in February. 7 million masks in March, 7 million masks in April, and we're now nearly two weeks into May, so 3.5 million masks uh, in May. So we could have had 24.5 million and uh, 95 masks that we now do not have at this point. There is still an N95 shortage of masks. We would love to have such masks ourselves. I'm sure your family would love to have them too. But we can't because of the criminal negligence of the administration. Uh, by the way, I recognize 24 and a um, half million masks by this time would still not be enough for all Americans to have access to these masks. But still, the supply would be much more plentiful, and certainly none of our health care personnel would be lacking these masks. None of them would be lacking these masks. So what's the next crisis? Let me share the next article, and we shall see. The next crisis is up to 43 million Americans could lose health insurance due to the pandemic, a study shows. Okay, so we have seen uh, job losses for more than 33 million people in the last um, two months. And there were uh, 6 million people unemployed before that, so we're looking at 35 to 40 million people. And of course, I covered the, uh, the situation with respect to the disemployed. On Saturday, I pointed out that that number is already up to, what did I say it was, 47.7 million people Okay, are uh, disemployed. In other words, that counts people no longer um, actually in the labor force officially, but who would likely to take um, full-time jobs if they could have them. Because health insurance is tied to employment for about half the country, 160 million people, as many as 43 million are expected to lose their health insurance due to the pandemic. According to a new report by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, hardly a radical group, and the Urban Institute. The Urban Institute has been very conservative lately and very much a faux fiscal responsibility group. But they are telling you 43 million Americans could lose their um, um, insurance. We already had more than 30 million. It wasn't clear how much more than 30 million. I always thought, or I thought recently anyway, that it was up to 37 million. If I was right about that, we're talking about uh, 80 million Americans without um, um, insurance. And I could can tell you that would correspond to 100,000 fatalities per year due to lack of health insurance alone. That doesn't count COVID-19 uh, patients, though it pr probably overlaps with the COVID figures uh, some. And by the way, 
Okay, our COVID figures have gone substantially above the 80,000 mark as of today, since we think there's an appreciable amount of undercount there. We're probably looking at figures above 90,000 or maybe even 95,000. According to the Department of Labor, the current employment rate is 14.7 percent, uh, but some economists estimate that between 19 percent and 23.6 percent of Americans are actually uh, out of a job, and I estimated uh, something like that during my live stream okay, on Saturday night, that in fact more than 25 percent were actually um, out of a job um, at this point. That is to say 25 percent of the workforce um, out of a job. Including those who lost their jobs in the last two weeks and those who have not filed jobless claims. Uh, the pandemic exposes a lot of inadequacies in our health care system. Uh, RWJF uh, senior policy and, uh, analyst Catherine Hempstead told The Guardian adding that health care is tied to employment for no real reason. Well, there are historical reasons why, and there are functional reasons why. It, it benefits some people to have health care tied to uh, employment. And even though there are many people it does not um, actually benefit, there are many people who think they do benefit from health care being tied to um, employment because they believe in reducing the mobility of labor. And they see it as reducing the mobility okay, of labor. So, on social media, Indiana congressional candidate uh, Veronica Zayo argued that there is a reason the U.S. system links people's ability to seek medical care to their ability to hold a job which offers health benefits. And she says, quote, it's to hold a bargaining chip over the working class's head. Well, that's the way some people see it. I have no doubt okay, about that. And she says it's about, quote, do what, you, we, what we want for the pittance we're paying or you're going to lose your health care, unquote, she wrote. And she tweeted about this also. And she's in the Indiana 4th, if you want to support her in any way, folks. Last month, the Economic Policy Institute estimated that 12.7 million people had already lost their employer-based health insurance. This article says it's on its way up to 43 million people. Oh, boy. Um, of the Americans who lose insurance due to layoffs or furloughs, RWJF and the Urban Institute said an estimated 7 million will remain uninsured, unable to access health care through Medicaid or COBRA, another law which allows Americans to pay for health insurance they had through their employer, but that can cost hundreds of dollars per month for individual coverage. With millions expected to join the more than 27 million Americans who were uninsured before the pandemic, that figure is totally underestimated. It has never been as low as 27 million Americans. It was above 30 million Americans by the end of the Obama administration. And the Trump administration has been working assiduously since to cripple the Affordable Care Act so that more and more people were going to opt out of it. Um, um, I've estimated, based on evidence from, uh, from previous articles, that we had actually grown from 30 million uncovered, 30 million or a little more uncovered by the end of the Obama administration, to something like 37 million now. I think there's a lot of evidence for that. 
RWJF and the Urban Institute raised concerns that many are going to uh, actually avoid medical attention if they begin showing the symptoms of the virus. Of course, this raises the risk of spreading the illness in their communities. And remember, we're opening up again. We're opening up again. We're opening up again and letting people who are going to avoid medical attention go back out. Go back out and spread the disease to many other people. The American healthcare financing system was not built to withstand the combined impact of a pandemic and a reception and a recession, said uh, Adam Gaffney, the president of Physicians for a National Health Program, and he said to the Guardian, "Quote: It's inevitable that people will die because they can't get the care they need because of the looming uh, recession." See what I mean by tragic comedy? Yes, it's a tragedy more than, uh, uh, it's a comedy, but what makes it a comedy is the incompetence, the sheer incompetence of those in authority trying to handle uh, the problem. So Wired had an interesting article, which I'm now going to share for you also. The Wired article was an interesting piece of analysis. It was written by Gilad uh, 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 Edelman, and the headline is, His Death's Mount, Trump's Disinformation Strategy Will Adapt. First, he started out by bashing the epidemiological models and simply denying the reality of the crisis. And Trump was saying on March 10th, just stay calm, it will go away. Two months later, as the official death count pushes above 70,000, of course, now, at the time of this live stream, it's above 80,000. I didn't see the figures this morning. I'd wager they're 82,000 or 83,000. Two months later, as the official death count pushes above 70,000, this approach is obsolete. The future has happened. So now it's time to question the recent uh, past, says um, Edelman. So Trump's been complaining privately that the official death numbers from COVID-19 are inflated. When everybody else believes they're deflated. According to an anonymous administration official, the president will soon begin to share <laughs> this idea <coughs> in public. Fox News, perhaps the most trusted source of information for the president and his followers, has already pushed the deaths are exaggerated theory, despite the fact that official death counts almost certainly understate the true death toll because many people are dying, often at home without being tested. So get ready for the COVID-19 information war to open a new front. Questioning the death toll. I'm sorry, honey, do you think something's wrong? Yeah, on my page, your picture there, and a square hair with stuff in it. So I don't know why you don't see it. Uh, this is what your page should look like. But it's got one thing inside that. I think it's your computer. That's not what you want. Bring it in to show you. Well, let me see what's here. Okay. Okay. Sorry, folks. Um, Maybe other people will see it. Okay, I'm getting a message from Bonnie suggesting that there's something wrong with my stream. 
but it looks like it's fine so it must just be her computer so please excuse us I thought it was worth actually checking out so getting back to the article questioning the death toll would be a savvy tactical shift for the forces of doubt and they point out it's hard to count the dead from a viral pandemic it points out that a New York Times analysis defines the real toll, quote-unquote, by looking at the difference between expected and actual deaths from all causes in March and April. But it correctly points out this approach has its weaknesses. The coronavirus is not the only thing that might be affecting mortality trends. In California and Texas, for example, deaths were well below expected levels in January. Does that mean there was some kind of life-extending inverse pandemic um, going on? If someone avoids getting treatment for a heart condition because they're afraid of catching COVID-19, should that go into the death toll? And he says that's a question for philosophers as much as um, epidemiologists. And he's quite right about that. As a result, the highly suspect claim okay, that the death count is exaggerated can be smuggled into saner statements such as death tolls are uncertain or the numbers that you're seeing in the media are misleadingly precise. The irreducible element of uncertainty is a boon for skeptics because this sort of information warfare is asymmetric. The harder it is for scientists and public health officials to nail down precise answer, answers, the easier it is to sow doubt. And of course, that is quite true. And the article goes on, okay, in this, uh, this vein, uh, but it also points out that if you're saying climate change will never be a problem, you might not live uh, long enough to find out that you're wrong. But if you said a few months ago that COVID-19 wouldn't be a big deal um, in the United States, well, you've already been debunked. And that is a very, very good point. And he says, sure, it's possible that death toll trutherism will crumble if states ease restrictions prematurely and infection rates shoot up. But one should never underestimate the president's ability, aided by Fox News, to shape his supporters' perceptions of uh, 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 reality. According to a daily tracking poll by Civics, Republicans' level of concern over local outbreaks peaked in early April and has plummeted over the past month. Even in states that have been seeing a sharp increase in cases over that span. And the disturbing fact that coronavirus deaths are disproportionately concentrated among um, African Americans, and it's possible to imagine a real split emerging over the basic, if necessarily murky, question of how many people have died. Then there's the matter of who's responsible for however many deaths the president concedes did happen. Like a lawyer pleading in the alternative, Trump has always presented parallel theories to the American jury. The situation isn't as bad as everyone says. But then again, the bad situation isn't his fault. As part of an effort to promote the latter argument, the White House has promoted a questionable origin story for the pandemic that blames it on Chinese mismanagement or malfeasance. And, of course, the Secretary of State has been saying that. And he's been declaring that China could have prevented uh, the deaths of hundreds of thousands of people worldwide. Of course, that's true. But Mr. Trump could have prevented uh, the deaths of 90% of the 80,000 who have already died here in the United States or could have prevented already 72,000 deaths, okay, according to the epidemiologist, if only he had shut down the country two weeks before he did. So there it is. Okay. And there's a Trump uh, death clock um, illustration here. 
Somewhere in uh, New York, somebody thought to put up that clock. It's probably in New York. Yeah, it's Times Square billboard. As with casting doubt on the U.S. death toll, blaming China takes advantage of conditions favorable to conspiracy theorizing. Chinese government's early attempts to conceal the extent of the outbreak really did hamper the global response. And it's not crazy to think there might be a, a link between a lab that housed bat-borne coronaviruses and an outbreak of a bat-linked coronavirus, though so far the weight of the evidence suggests um, otherwise. This presents a delicate challenge for would-be debunkers. It's tempting to confront misleading claims with their exact opposite. Yes, the official count is precisely accurate. No, we know for sure the virus did not originate in a lab, but those claims aren't true. Meanwhile, picking fights about the past, how many people have already died, where the virus got started, gives cover for the truth or shift in tactics. No longer works to say the experts are panicked over nothing. COVID models are not great, but in the broadest sense, they've been correct. And the new coronavirus uh, um, did arrive in the U.S. Tens of thousands or more have already died. Desperate claims to the contrary were destined to be disproven. But when it comes to arguing with skeptics over what has already happened, we can't just wait um, them out. A very good, a very wise article. Yes, there is a we told you so. We told you COVID-19 was going to be a big deal. It has become a big deal. You said otherwise, you the skeptics, you were wrong. That is absolutely clear at this point. Meanwhile, Dave Dayan has continued his uh, good blogging, his good writing about, uh, about COVID. So let me share sorry I hit the wrong thing here let me share one of his last two pieces the title of the article is unsanitized of course they all start with unsanitized feeding people because they are hungry and that was done on uh, Sunday May 10th this was the daily report okay, for May 10th this was written by Michael Lipsky who was pinch hitting for Dave on Sunday And he reports that uh, in something of a rebellion, uh, school lunch officials are taking the initiative to extend the food safety net beyond what existing policy allows. In short, they're feeding people because they're hungry. They're doing this in Los Angeles. They're doing this um, uh, in Baltimore. As one manager has said, quote, we're supposed to be here to meet to the needs of the community. How could I say no? So they can't say no. Even though it's against uh, the policies, some people can't say no. And they're doing the best uh, they can. Some children choose not to eat the free lunch offered at their school because they don't want to be stigmatized. But is society worse off if some children whose parents aren't um, certifiably poor get a free meal? School lunches could become a public good, like libraries and fire protection. When it comes to feeding people, there have always been different approaches to assessing um, eligibility. Um, 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 uh, while means testing is one way, taking people at their word okay, is another. And he goes on, Michael Lipsky does, uh, to go into the history of this okay, a little. 
points out that near riots occurred in a few cities as applicants forced their way into food uh, pantries in fear they would close before they could be served. And he says, in food policy, we can consider taking people at their word when they say they don't have enough to eat. Yes, some people who are not truly hungry might take advantage of the program. Some people who are truly hungry might not be poor, but the benefits might be great. Greater public support, reduced stigma for people in need, uh, greater recognition that food security is a society-wide concern, the elimination of program expenses associated with the verification. In the current plague environment, we're seeing workers in positions to be helpful suspending normal rules of governance at their own discretion. Their instincts to respond to perceived need are those similar to those of neighbors helping neighbors after floods, hurricanes, and other natural disasters. A sense of crisis dominates our current discourse. People are making masks out of scraps and fash and they're fashioning uh, so, uh, uh, um, but some of the medical gear out of trash bags. Healthcare workers, grocery clerks, and bus drivers are now first responders. In the urgency of coping with the pandemic, an emergent sense of community is revealing what a more human set of um, the priorities might uh, look like. And I think that is pretty important and not part of the tragedy aspect of this okay, at all, but part of people beginning to pull together to face this particular crisis. And on Monday, Dave Dayan came back. Oh, that is today, May 11th and unsanitized that small businesses realize small business loans aren't meant to save small business. Oh, that was a devastating column. On the first round of the Paycheck Protection Program, the PPP started in early April, the government couldn't fit the enormous demand through the system. $350 billion was dispensed within two weeks. I don't think it was really dispensed. I think it was committed to be dispensed within two weeks. Then, well, intention, progressive watchdogs decided to get irate, calling out a program design flaw. Chains with less than 500 employees at each of their locations were eligible for PPP, and plenty took advantage. With the program oversubscribed, the theory went that mid-sized firms with access to capital markets were cutting the line and depriving the local family-owned restaurant or corner store from um, aid. The PR friendly spurred the Treasury Department to refine the rules, suggesting that all loans over $2 million would be audited and that genuine hardship must be shown. As a result, nearly all of the, quote, undeserving, unquote, companies highlighted gave back the money. In a world with expected high demand for the second round, that cash would be cycled through to other businesses, neither increasing nor de decreasing the amount of payroll workers assisted. But a funny thing happened along the way, like a funny thing happened along the way to the forum, right? On the way to the forum. Owners figured out that the PPP doesn't do much for their personal survival. They should have gotten a hint when it was called the Paycheck Protection Program. It was effectively a pass-through grant to workers to keep them on the payroll for two months. Whether they came into work or not. Only one quarter of the loan amount could be used for anything other than salary or else the loan would remain a loan. And the last thing small businesses with no revenue and uncertain future want right now is additional debt. In other words, it shouldn't have been a loan, which is what we thought from the start. It should have been an outright grant to small business.
As the Wall Street Journal p pointed out late Friday, PPP loans are now just sitting there. The first round went out the door in two weeks. Today, two weeks after the opening of round two, about 40% of the funds are left. The journal, the Wall Street Journal, attributes this to three developments. First, a lot of the initial demand came from companies trying with multiple financial institutions to obtain the first come, first served uh, loan. Full disclosure, the prospect, that is the publication we're talking about here, received a PPP loan with the fifth institution we tried. So I can confirm that was a thing. Second, the shaming of public companies and big chains dampened demands for large loans. Average loan size at the end of April was 79000 down from 206000 in the first round. And third, owners have concluded PPP doesn't meet uh, their needs. Some had trouble hiring back staff because unemployment is temporarily a better deal. More important is word traveled that 75% of the loan had to go to payroll. Businesses with high rent or a lot of fixed expenses realized PPP would not assist their survival. For example, every restaurant and bar in New York or Boston or San Francisco. The lack of clarity over how loans will be made forgivable is also threatening demand because small businesses like this don't want to take on debt. I would add a final piece. It's May 11th. The lockdowns began in mid-March. At most, the really tiny businesses had about three weeks of uh, reserves. So demand may be slipping because demand has died along with the small businesses. Um, again, it's called the Paycheck Protection Program. The goal is to protect paychecks, not the businesses. The requirement for forgiveness of the loans that 75% be spent on salary isn't quite in the text of the CARES Act. That's an approximation of the language that Congress inserted. But the legislation does make clear that the grants are available for those keeping payroll continuous. Now, you may see that as a dumb goal, considering the paycheck protection was temporary and it operated at cross-purposes with the unemployment boost, which was also temporary but bigger. Congress was dictating to keep people on payrolls and also to take people off payrolls at the same time. But whatever the case, you can't expect a business owner to judge an offer of relief without thinking about its effect on the business. If PPP won't help save them from ruin, they're not likely to take it. Why would they? And he says, I thought that, uh, that mediating the PPP through self-interested banks would cause it to fail. Um, actually mediating it through self-interested um, business owners was the problem for take-up. Of course, this makes the witch hunt over undeserving businesses taking the loans more monstrous. Before canceling, larger firms was just going to redistribute funds to smaller ones. Now it's just taking larger firms out of the programs and not redistributing the money at all. It's just getting a bunch of workers fired. So, for example, hotel chains are giving back the money, and their workers include, you know, low-wage housekeepers, um, and many of whom, let's face it, are undocumented and won't be eligible for unemployment. So this jihad took money away from them. In the short term, sorry, I scrolled too fast. In the short term, that uh, dynamic might put more government money into the economy. Everyone for, from a larger firm gives back to PPP, gets fired, and goes on unemployment and gets a bigger paycheck. Over the longer term, of course, by making the small business program unusable for small businesses, it means fewer businesses out there hiring when this is over and paying rent and buying supplies from vendors and all the economic activity associated with the business. It means it's harder to get a job. It means more momentum towards a depression. Why wasn't saving the business a goal of the small business program? Why would anyone consider it a better world to have workers on payroll for two months than to have a surviving small business sector? 
uh, Marco Rubio, the architect of this program, has a ton of explaining to do. Marco, you got some explaining to do. And the next section is titled, Gimme Your Retirement Money. There's been another round of deficit worrying this time out of the White House, but fear not. They have a plan. The Hoover Institution and the American Enterprise Institute, led by Andrew Biggs, the leading opponent of social insurance programs like Social Security, have floated a scheme which administration economists are perusing that would let Americans take up to $5,000 in checks now in exchange for having their Social Security benefits delayed by an equal amount in the future. This is the ultimate robbing to pay Peter to pay Paul move, and Alex Lawson at Social Security Works rightly condemned it. Quote, Trump's advisors are pushing a plan that would force people to choose. Go hungry today or work until you die. Unquote, he said. Unquote again. Any plan that raids Social Security is a moral abomination. Unquote. Well, I'd say the same thing. And Dave says, I expect this kind of thing from the American Enterprise Institute and the Hoover Institution, but last week, Wharton professor Natasha Sarin, a protege of Larry Summers, who, as we have reported, is advising the Biden campaign, co-authored a research paper that would do exactly the same thing. Use a portion of future Social Security benefits on current uh, needs. The benefit, according to the abstract, is that this approach, quote, does not increase the overall liabilities of the federal government, unquote. And Dave says, oh, good. Now, since the liabilities of the federal government can always be paid by the federal government because it's a monetary sovereign, who cares about the increase in the overall uh, liabilities of the federal government? Of course, not an economist who is a protege of Larry Summers, because Larry Summers has still got a problem with high debt, because Larry Summers still hasn't absorbed the lessons of modern money theory. He still doesn't understand that he's dealing with a monetary sovereign in dealing with the United States. So why the hell is he in the position of advising a presidential candidate today when he doesn't even understand federal finance? Only you can answer that question. Biden has called for an immediate $200 a month increase to Social Security. His advisors want to cannibalize it. Biden already has a pretty shaky history on Social Security. If he wants to retain any trust at all, uh, then uh, uh, Ms. Natasha Sarin shouldn't be his advisor anymore. I should say Professor Natasha Sarin. So, so that's another part of the comedy of errors. Advisors to presidential candidates telling them, we have to worry about our liabilities, which is another way of saying, we have to worry about the increase in our national debt. Not. So, next. We come back again to this monstrous idea. This is from a Common Dreams article by Jake Johnson, and it's about the Trump administration's monstrous idea, direct payments in exchange for cuts to Social Security benefits. Suddenly concerned about the growing national debt, now that corporations have secured access to trillions of dollars in COVID-19 bailout funds with little oversight, Trump administration officials are reportedly considering several proposals purportedly aimed at reducing government spending. There they are. After allowing corporations to secure access to trillions of dollars 
in COVID-19 bailout funds with little uh, oversight, suddenly the Trump administration is worried about excessive government spending. And don't forget the tax cuts that he wants to give them now, too, <laughs> including a pair of plans that would provide Americans with cash payments in exchange for delays or cuts to their Social Security benefits. In addition to weighing a push for automatic federal spending cuts that would take effect once the economy rebounds from the coronavirus crisis, exactly what the Republicans did after they overspent when they came into office K initially with tax cuts they pushed through in 2011, then they started bargaining with the Democrats from their position in control of the House for automatic federal spending cuts. If you remember, that's what the fiscal cliff was about in 2012 and 2013. They thought the economy had rebounded enough by then, even though it was the slowest recovery from a recession the United States has ever experienced during the post-war period, still the Republicans were all for automatic federal spending cuts once they thought we were out of the recession. Uh, anyway, the Washington Post reported on Sunday that top White House economic officials are exploring a proposal floated by two conservative scholars as long as the corporations get the money so they can in turn fund foundations like the AEI and foundations like the Heritage Foundation, uh, they are all for putting the burden on ordinary Americans. This proposal would allow, our, uh, would allow Americans to choose to receive checks of up to 5000 in exchange for a delay of their Social Security benefits. After all, why not? Because these uh, same Americans, if they don't take the $5,000, uh, might have to go out there and work, and they might be dead anyway. So they might not be able to get the Social Security benefits anyway. I mean, this is awful, folks. Senior administration officials have also discussed the Eagle Plan, a 29-page memo that called for an overhaul of federal retirement programs in exchange for upfront payments to some workers. Okay, the proposal calls, according to the Post, for giving Americans 10000 upfront in exchange for curbing their federal retirement benefits, um, unquote, for years they've been trying to reduce Social Security. They're trying to kill Social Security again. Their least favorite program, they've been trying to kill it since um, uh, FDR, while telling us, we love Social Security, just let us have a chance at managing it. And we, stupid people, of course, have given them plenty of chances to begin to manage Social Security. And, by the way, it has always worked out very, very poorly for the Social Security recipients, with the exception of what was going on in the Eisenhower administration. Eisenhower was the big exception when it came to friendliness to Social Security benefits. That's since the 1930s. The Eagle Plan was crafted by a State Department official close to President Donald Trump's son-in-law and senior advisor, Jared Kushner. It's like making a six-year-old your senior advisor, who forwarded the proposal of the White House Council of Economic Advisors. Art Laffer, the Laffer himself, a conservative economist and Trump advisor, told the Post he supports the proposal. Of course, Art. He's always been in favor of getting rid privatizing Social Security. Alex Lawson, executive director of Advocacy Group, so Advocacy Group Social Security Works, said in a statement Monday the plan would force people to choose 
go hungry today or work until you die when you get older? Wonderful choice, right? Quote, the Trump administration is obsessed. I have a suggestion, by the way. Why didn't we have a corporate bailout um, loan scheme which offered the corporations the choice of taking the loans now or being bought out uh, by the government in a new scheme for nationalization? How about that? How about that? We could have given them the choice. If you take the loans, uh, you die. And if you don't take the loans, you go hungry today. How about that? But we didn't do that. Instead, uh, the Trump administration is proposing we do that to people and not the corporations. And Alex Lawson said, quote, The Trump administration is obsessed with using the coronavirus crisis to undermine our social security system. Social Security is an earned insurance benefit, he says. It's not a piggy bank. This plan and any plan that raids Social Security is a moral abomination. Instead of trying to steal the earned benefits of desperate people, the government should be spending 2000 a month for everyone in America, as Democrats in Congress um, have proposed. It would be nice if Alex Lawson would mention the Jayapal Tlaib um, ABC Act. It would be nice if he would mention that because that act actually provides for minting platinum coins to support the $2,000 a month. After understanding what is in that particular bill, then maybe Alex Lawson could learn to say to the administration that there is no need for any of this with respect to Social Security. In fact, he might even be able to admit that there is no money in the Social Security trust funds, that that is only an accounting record and that whether get people get paid their Social Security not or not depends upon when Congress appropriates the funds. Maybe then Alex could come out and advocate for a bill guaranteeing Social Security in um, um, perpetuity and ordering the Treasury Department to mint uh, funds, to mint uh, by platinum coins uh, using face values uh, sufficient to pay for Social Security's bills in perpetuity. How about that, Alex? How about learning that lesson? But Alex is right when he says... The only reason to support it over sending people 2000 a month is to undermine our Social Security system. That's right, because 2000 a month could just as easily be sent to people after minting those platinum coins. And if you don't like minting platinum coins, that's all right, too. Congress could just order the Fed, could just order the Fed to top up the Treasury spending account with the amount of the appropriation that uh, is necessary to cover the $2,000 a month to, uh, to every American for the duration of the crisis. Hogan Gidley, a White House spokesman, indicated Trump is opposed to the ideas laid out in the um, eagle plan, quote-unquote, which he described as ludicrous on his face, but the Post reported the president 
has not actually reviewed uh, the proposal. I don't know if that means anything, because I wonder if the president ever does review any proposals. After vowing during his 2016 presidential run to shield Social Security and Medicare from cuts, Trump has proposed slashing both programs in his annual budgets. Trump also said during an interview at the World Economic Forum in Davos in January that he would consider cuts to Social Security and Medicare if he was re-elected in November. So that should be your cue, folks. Don't re-elect them. And amid a global pandemic that has left more than 30 million people in the U.S. jobless, Trump's top economic stimulus idea has been cutting the payroll tax, which funds Social Security and Medicare. No, it does not fund Social Security okay, and Medicare. The payroll tax does not fund anything. It only destroys those funds. Now, it does create okay, an accounting record of what, in theory, the Treasury Department owes to the Social Security program. But, of course, that's just a theory, because whether it really owes that to Social Security or not depends on whether Congress appropriates Social Security spending that would make use of those funds. And Congress hasn't actually done that. The president said during a Fox News town hall last week that he would not sign any future COVID-19 stimulus package that does not include a payroll tax cut. And Representative uh, Pramila Jayapal, claiming the, uh, playing this nonsensical game, says, quote, Donald Trump and his administration will stop at nothing to cut Social Security, unquote. Uh, the progressives in Congress never tire of playing, of using the progressive give-up um, formula. Here making it credible that the Social Security payroll tax is actually funding Social Security when most people by now must know that it's doing no such thing. Next, Republican senator who voted for the Trump tax cuts in the corporate slush fund now says they're not enough there's not enough money to help everybody harmed by COVID-19. I told you this was coming when? Two weeks ago? Three weeks ago? When everybody was saying, oh, it's now proven that they can appropriate all this money for the $4.6 trillion slush fund and other things for business, and they don't even talk about how you're going to pay for it. And now, all of a sudden, when it comes to, uh, to bailing out ordinary people, suffering, when it comes to bailing out the millions across the United States suffering from the economic effects of the virus and the health impacts of the virus, there's not enough money to provide relief to everyone harmed by the pandemic. Only enough money to provide corporations relief. To stop them from being harmed by the pandemic. To keep their profits high. There's not enough money to help everybody hurt when you shut down the government. Who's shutting down the government? Get back to the Senate. Get back to the Senate. Nothing should be shut down there. You people should be in session. Like the frontline workers. You're frontline workers. You should be in session. Or you should resign. Quote, we have to reopen the economy. We have to do it carefully. We have to let people go back to work and earn a living, unquote, said Alexander. I don't see us being able to appropriate much more money to help provide a counter to that. That, folks, is a lie. They might want, not want to appropriate any more money. They might be opposed to giving people what they need. But as our friend Stephanie Kelton, professor of economics at Stony Brook University, tweeted on Sunday, 
she, quote, can't believe we're hearing we're out of money in the early stages of crisis again, unquote. And quote again. The truth is Congress can appropriate whatever it chooses, unquote, Kelton said. Quote again, it literally cannot run out of money, unquote. However, the Treasury spending account can run out um, um, of money. How? Well, it can be the case that we hit a debt ceiling and Congress refuses to extend at a debt ceiling and Treasury refuses to mint the platinum coin. Or it could be the case that Congress refuses to order the Fed to top up the Treasury spending account so it can spend the congressional appropriation. Those things can happen. But, as Stephanie says, those things are a matter of choice. Congress can appropriate whatever it chooses, and it can order the Fed to do whatever Congress chooses, including topping up the Treasury spending account, including accepting a deposit of any platinum coins the Treasury chooses to meet and to use the proceeds from those coins to top up of the Treasury spending account. The Working Families Party is catching on. It's said that Republicans, quote, took care of their billionaire buddies and Wall Street bankers, unquote, and now they're trying to say there's not enough left to help you and your family? It's a lie, the group tweeted. It is a lie. Larry Kudlow, President Donald Trump's ta top um, economic advisor. Notice, Trump's top um, economic advisor is someone who hardly ever has a clue about where the economy is going or what okay, it is doing. I don't even know if Larry Kudlow is an economist. As far as I knew, he was always a business journalist who is making a big fuss over gold or various other uh, um, anachronisms like the national debt, of course, until he became a part of the Trump administration when, of course, increasing the national debt is fine as long as you're not giving money to people, as long as you're giving it to corporations. Formal negotiations with Congress over the next COVID-19 stimulus package have been suspended even as other White House officials predict the U.S. unemployment rate could surpass 20% by next month, try 25% by next month. Under the CARES Act, which Trump signed into law in March, expanded unemployment benefits are set to expire by July 31st without additional action from Congress. <laughs> as the Trump administration and Senate Republicans stall on additional relief claiming to be concerned about rising national debt, House Democrats are in the process of crafting their own stimulus bill that could be unveiled as early as this week. The package, according to Axios, everybody's guessing about that, is expected to include an increase in federal nutrition assistance, SNAP, okay, and Medicare funding, expanded unemployment benefits, and another round of direct stimulus payments. Oh, goody, they're going to give us another $1,200 a person. Oh, goody. Well, that's better than nothing at all. But what we really need is the Jayapal Klaib ABC Act, the Automatic Booster Communities Act. That is what we need. We need it for the money it's going to provide to the economy. And we need it also, we need it also for the purpose of teaching people that platinum coins can be minted rather than debt instruments sold in order to fund deficit spending. By the way, debt instruments don't really fund a deficit spending, but that will be a story for another day. Uh, I'm being messaged while I'm live streaming.
Ah, yes. Uh, so Arakel reminds me to remind you. I'm sorry. Stephanie reminds me, okay, to remind you that I have an interview tomorrow night, okay, with Arakel Bloss um, at 9 o'clock. I'm really looking forward to that interview. We'll be talking about her work on the coronavirus, which has been her main work for some weeks now. Um, 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 Arakel is very accomplished um, as an activist, and I can't wait to hear her views over things. So please be sure and tune in tomorrow night. Uh, at 9 o'clock, and I'm going to do a special event for that as well, so people will be able to share it. So, uh, look for the special event, should it be appearing uh, uh, later tonight, if I can remember how to do a special event again. <laughs> I, I do one, and then it goes right out of my mind how I did it. Anyway, the last thing... I'll share tonight is a piece called <laughs> a piece called The Free Market is Working declares for profit health industry front group. No, say Medicare for All Advocates. It is not. This one was by John Kelly, a staff writer at Common Dreams. And John Kelly spelled Q-U-E-A-L-L-Y. Spelled the old way, I guess. While the ravages of the coronavirus pandemic have only intensified calls to do away with costly and deadly for-profit insurance industry, health insurance industry um, in the United States. The corporate back Partnership for America's Healthcare Future, an industry lobby group formed in 2018 to combat the Medicare for All movement, wants people to believe that the so-called, quote, free market, unquote, is doing just fine to take care of people's needs amidst the outbreak Really? Where's my N95 uh, masks? Where are they? I can't buy one. That's one of my needs. I can't get tested. Can't get tested for the coronavirus, for COVID-19. That's one of my needs. I have Kaiser Healthcare. Usually Kaiser is great and wonderful for various things. But Kaiser can't fill my need for a test. I need to be tested every week. That's what I need. Why can't I be tested every week? Because this administration didn't get the tests in from the World Health Organization quickly enough and didn't have alternative tests approved quickly enough, because this administration has been incompetent, and the free market has been incompetent too, because guess what? It's not producing these tests so every American can get them cheap, so we can afford them. So the free market is not working. After the lobby group shared such a message on social media Sunday, students for a national health program a membership organization made up of medical school students, which advocates for Medicare for All, took issue and responded, tweeting, It's not doing a good job. Never has, never will. Hashtag working together is not working at all. This was in response to a tweet from the Partnership for America's Healthcare Future. The free market is hashtag working together to fill the gaps Medicare and Medicaid can't for our most vulnerable learn about their efforts. I got news for them, okay, in the first place. The, the free market, if it were really a free market, would not be working together with the federal government. 
the free market would be working together with other people in the free market in order to fill the gaps. That tweet is a virtual admission that the free market can't actually do anything except if it's not a free market. It's got to do something in partnership with the federal government to get anything done at all. That's what hashtag working together means. As part of its industry-backed PR push, I mean, that is just double-think, folks. As part of its industry-backed PR push, the lobby group, also known by its acronym P4AHCF, boy, that's a hard one to remember, P4AHCF, 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 can't, can't cope with that one at all, claim that public-private partnerships and innovative programs are filling the gaps Medicare and Medicaid can't. If it's a public-private partnership, it's not a free market, idiots. It's not a free market. Go read your Adam Smith. He doesn't talk about public-private partnerships. He talks about laissez-faire. On Monday, P4AHCF declared in a separate tweet that, quote, its members are working together to strengthen the employer-provided coverage more than 180 million Americans rely on. They're not even supposed to be working together. They're supposed to be in competition. If it's a free market, competition is supposed to produce the benefits for all of us. That message arrived on the heels of a new analysis published last week that showed an estimated 43 million Americans could lose their employer-provided health insurance this year as the economic downturn triggered by COVID-19 has skyrocketed unemployment to levels not seen since the Great uh, Depression. So tell me, folks, when 43 million people have lost their health insurance, um, in addition to the 37 million people who didn't have it before that, and we have 80 million people who have lost, who have no health insurance, will the free market be able to produce insurance policies for us that will cover all of us at a cost um, cheap enough for the people without a job to be able to buy into a private health insurance program? Is the free market going to produce that for us? Ridiculous. That is a ridiculous possibility. Never has, never will. Even before this crisis, there were 37 million people the free market, quote-unquote, wasn't providing for, and indeed, there hasn't been a free market in healthcare for a very long time. There's been a managed market, a market managed by donors, managed by the providers, managed by the pharmaceuticals, managed by the health insurance industry. That's what we've had. We haven't had a free market for ages and ages and ages. I haven't had a free market in my lifetime. Never, never. And I'm 81. As Common Dreams reported Sunday, the report by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the Urban Institute, is just the latest to illustrate the failures of a health system that ties coverage to employment. Senator Bernie Sanders, the nation's most pro 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 high profile and backer of Medicare for All, has made this argument repeatedly. And Bernie tweeted, number of Americans between the ages of 0 and 64 at risk of losing their health insurance during this crisis, 43 million. Number of Americans 65 and older at risk of losing their health insurance, zero. That is why we need hashtag Medicare for all. And on Monday, journalist John Walker a former blogger at Fire Dog Lake, another former blogger okay, at Fire Dog Lake. We've covered a lot of Ryan Grimm's things here 
in a lot of um, but Dave Dayan's things here. And they also were bloggers, okay, at Fire Dog Lake. And John published a piece for the American Prospect titled, A Guide to the Nightmare of Getting Health Insurance in a Pandemic. And here is a nice flow chart, my not-so-fun flow chart of what a nightmare shopping for the best health insurance is after losing your employer insurance during a pandemic produced depression. So simple, right? And he, put, he gives us a very complicated little flow chart. It was a great idea to flow chart this out uh, to show the complexity of getting health insurance coverage. Walker paints a picture of a healthcare system that is decidedly, quote, not working, unquote, for those who need it most. Losing your health insurance when you lose your job is confusing in the best of times and even more so during the coronavirus. In addition to needing to deal with all the inherent complexities of our system, there are now numerous additional economic, political, and health factors that make it very difficult to know what is financially the best choice. So is the so-called free market working? You gotta be kidding. You gotta be kidding. So here is something that I hope will play at this point. It should theoretically play. So let's see if it does. This is a Stiller and Mira piece that ran uh, at the time the Clintons were trying to improve our health care, okay, in the middle 90s, it was an answer to the Harry and uh, 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 Louise campaign. Let's see if I can get this. Hey, Louise. You mean that worried couple on the insurance? Companies, commercials. They're so confused about health care. And this is not doing so well because it's going in uh, second hand. Yeah, and you're confused because they're confused. <laughs> ah, I'm sorry, this is not a viable thing. Uh, but you can check out uh, the link. Okay, and you can go to you Twitter. There's got to be a better way. There is. Okay, and you can get it uh, the yourself. System. Everyone is covered. You get full benefits. So this was in the 1990s, talking about a single-payer system. Okay, uh, Jerry Stiller just uh, died. Okay, and uh, John Nichols... Oh, uh, was a friend and you choose your own doctor. of uh, Be oh, uh, Jerry Stiller, okay, and Mira, uh, uh, and Mira, and uh, so um, he tweeted this, and of course it's very appropriate for us now. So I commend it uh, to you, and you should be able to access it. So let me get rid of the Twitter. I can't uh, directly play it from Common Dreams. It's on Twitter. But the final word on this. Is so. Is the so-called free market. Uh, working. And the question is. Uh, did it ever. And the answer is no. Absolutely not. And to even suggest that it is working in the middle of this crisis with over 80,000 dying due to COVID and most probably many of them uh, 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 people who did not even go to a hospital or who went too late because their insurance was uh, 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 inadequate. We don't know how many that is, but when this is all over, we're going to get account of that. 
and we're going to find out how much damage our not-so-free market, because it hasn't been a free market for a very long time, has actually done our insurance-molded market, our insurance-donor-controlled market. It isn't a free market. It's a managed market. And it is responsible for many of the horrors we are seeing in America during this particular pandemic. So, let me check on your comments now and see what you've had to say. I'm sure you've had a lot to say. And hopefully you've had a lot to share. And by the way, before I get to your comments, uh, let me remind you to please share, like, and subscribe. And remember my Patreon link at Joe underscore Firestone. And there it is. I'm using the ticker to display it now. So there you go, the ticker. <laughs> okay, I think you've seen the ticker enough times to remind you. Now I'm going to get to some comments. And Kay says, already shared. Thank you, Kay. And Lana says, Dr. Joe, don't forget the YouTube address, Kay, um, and the Patreon. Oh, gee, I had uh, the Patreon. I didn't have uh, the YouTube address. Okay, so my YouTube address is, uh, okay, if you go to YouTube and you uh, you search for Joseph um, Firestone, that is my channel, and you will find me. Okay, so that's it. I'll have to modify that banner so it's ready for next time. Okay, I can easily make it uh, 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 longer. Thank you for reminding me, Lana. Okay, Avril said, what did Dr. Campbell of the UK say today about uh, the COVID? I didn't hear very much of it. I really had a busy day today. And I was busy preparing for this in uh, too little time. So I heard it basically with, uh, with one ear uh, while I was getting ready for the live stream here. And I'm not sure of all that he said, but he was his usual careful self. Stephanie says, hey folks, migraine or not, I can share. Wonderful, Stephanie. And she says, I guess I'm off probation, only going to share to the largest groups I have. Thanks, Steph. And Steve Wolfbrand says, Affordable Care Act is not affordable. Absolutely not affordable. We all know it's not affordable. That's why it covered so few people. And many of the people who had covered it covered totally inadequately. Steve Gonzo says, Mint the coin. And of course, folks, the only book on minting the coin is uh, fixing the debt without breaking America. And you will find that book at josephmfirestone.com. And there is a link there from that book to, uh, to Amazon. It's an Amazon uh, Kindle book, and I hope you all know the Amazon Kindle software is free. All you do is download it to your computer, and once it's downloaded to your computer, and you buy the book, which is $9.99, and believe me, it's well worth it, uh, you can uh, then read it, and it's it can be on up to I believe it's six of your computers or five of your computers. So you can have it in all sorts of places. You can have it on your phone. You can have it on your iPad or your 
uh, your tab, okay, whatever it is, your tablet machine, or you can have it on your desktop, uh, okay, or you can have it on uh, your wife's computer, or, it's, you know, it's, it's there, okay. And you can make the type larger, you can make the type smaller, you can do all kinds of nice things. And you can also read it, and it's the most comprehensive coverage of the Platinum Coin in existence thus far. And it's been out there for a long time, by the way. It first was published in 2013. Yes, the Platinum Coin idea is that old. And it was revised in early 2014. And revised with some new appendices at that time. Anyway, Avromano says, we simply can't get sick. I treat myself with vitamins and supplements, but I know my days are numbered, but I sure don't want to die of uh, COVID. Neither do I, Carmen, neither do I. And Avril says, Trumpel Thinskin got pissed because a reporter called out his China propaganda. He stormed out from the address. Yeah, typical. He's such a drama queen, isn't he? Steve said, I saw that. Jim Bird said, look cool to me. And Greta says, it looks good on my end. It's not frozen. Thank you, Greta. And Avril says, I just, um, um, I just about it. Was it funny? <laughs> also, Avril, I think, was saying, I'm just joking about it. Was it funny? Kay says, looks good to me, Joe. Steve says, looks okay, Doc. And Steve says, kind of more like childish. And Steph says, I finally got the share. I'm off probation. Avril says, oh, okay, thanks. Well, did the orange turd turn red? Sorry, just kidding. Steve said, I'm back in jail for a week. Uh-oh, Steve. And Stephanie says, hello, A. Eh? My mentor, Eric Bloss, is here. It's great to see you. Dr. Joe will be interviewing her. I'm so excited. Um, I'm excited, too. Hi, Eric And Stephanie says, Facebook is a pain in the neck. Avril says, friends, don't ever eat figs. They contain dead wasp body parts. I researched it after I ate a piece, and it was like eating sand. Was that from the dead wasp? I've never had that experience with eating figs. Not that I eat figs too often, I have to say that. I don't even eat figgy pudding. <laughs> Steve said, so he told an Asian reporter to go ask China. She asked him why he's saying that to her. He got pissed and walked off the stage. Good for her. Good for her. I didn't see that. Steve Wolfbrand, I'm getting sick of FB. He says, we are all. I just did three months in Facebook jail. Okay, Avril says, oh my God, I misread the caption. I didn't know it was a Chinese reporter. He's such an embarrassment. Um, um, actually, I believe it was an American reporter of Chinese um, um, extraction. Uh, but from what I've heard, uh, she's an American. And I think he asked her to go back to China or some such nonsense. Stephanie smith Udy says, Hello everyone, I'm sorry I'm so late. When I get a migraine, it's hard for me to focus. But i got to share it to about 30 groups. Terrific, Steph. That's just what we needed. And Steve says, I don't know if she's Chinese. Um, Asian, though. Kay says, um, Asian American, I think, Stephen Avril. And Avril says, I had one for several days myself. I hope you feel better soon. Steve says, correct. I am even more concerned with how the virus is being spread how than how it being spread now than how it was originated. I'm more concerned too. Stephanie says, please check out the page www.coronastrike.us. Stephanie says, hello, Evelina, hello, Kay. 
Kay says, I need to get new glasses and maybe teeth work done, but won't do, uh, don't want to do even that now. No, uh, we need to get some of that work done too, but we were waiting for Bernie to win and for Medicare for All to pass because Medicare for All is going to cover dental work. Stephanie says, hi, uh, um, 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 Evelyn and my... And Kay, and then she says, hello, my friends. Avril says, he told a U.S. citizen to go back to China. Oh, my God, Asian people are going to be targeted by his racist base now. That's some of his vicious dog whistling that he gets away with. Stephanie says, hey, Dr. Joe, hope everyone is doing okay. Yeah, we're doing great. At least right now. Steve says, me too, broken tooth and broken glasses, laugh out loud. Get my stimulus on Wednesday and we'll spend it on those. Did you get a stimulus check? Yeah, we got ours very recently. We haven't spent it yet. We know much of it is going to go to repay debt, though. We know that. Stephanie says, there doesn't seem to be a lot of sharing. I haven't received one notification in my news feed. Could be FB messing with me. Yeah, it could be. Steve said, he didn't say go back to China. He said, go ask China. Oh, yeah, he did say go ask China. Yeah. Well, why would she know? I mean, why would she be any better able to ask China than I? Kay says, yes, Steve, I got mine the beginning of May. Just don't feel comfortable going anywhere except the store trips I have to make. Yeah, me neither. Steve says, yeah, me too. Jim says, we didn't get crap. We employ four people, but unemployment helped three of our employees, but one didn't get it because she applied too late, apparently. Steve says, I wouldn't trust them to forgive the loan. Kay says, they should not put a time limit on unemployment at all, especially now. I know. Evelina says, small business, um, Cuban-American community in Florida is going to be mad at Marco. Good! I hope they're mad at Marco. Kay says, need to scrap the cap on Social Security and expand it, not uh, cut it okay, or delay it. Russ says, I'm skeptical that the U.S. will survive um, the neoclassical economics okay, and neoliberalism. Steve says, a guy no. Kay says, please excuse my typos, glasses, and keyboard needs replaced. Then Laura says, I shared. And Steve says, we can usually figure out typos. We usually can. Kay says, I've always been a great speller, so they bother me. Laugh out loud. And Steve says, share to the public and friends. Stephanie says, oh, Dolores Pierce, Facebook could still be messing with me in a different way. Steph says, hello, Richard. It's good to see you. I think Richard prefers Rick. And Dolores says, true. And Stephanie says, our government is discussing they don't care about our elders because the government can't use them to work and use them as resources. It's shameful. Stephanie says, hey, Jim, great to see you. Havel says, because it contains a derivative of socialism and um, also neoliberals see that as a major obstacle to absolute rule and wage enslavement. It is. Stephanie said, they want to kill us all off. And then she says, Kay said that. Stephanie said, as long as we aren't useful to them, Kay. Kay says, exactly, Stephanie. Avril says, no, they want to work you for scraps for as long as possible. And Kay says, I work for scraps my whole damn life and I'm still screwed on SS2. And Avril says, until we are no longer able to physically work, uh, they have no need for us. So, folks, what do we need to do? We need to get that Biden record group really going viral because if we can get it viral and we can kick old Biden out of there and we can once again fight for Bernie, maybe we can get uh, 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 the president uh, we need. And please don't tell me you are over Bernie because the following is true. We can still drive Biden's poll numbers down so low that people see he's not electable. And then, if we get to do that by the convention, what other thing could we do that um, 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 is better 
of then getting Bernie uh, to run again on some ticket. If they don't want him on the Democratic ticket, what could be better than trying to get him to run on a third party ticket between uh, the convention and uh, election day? What more worthwhile thing could we do during that period of time uh, than work for that to happen? I don't know, maybe a general strike would be more valuable. Maybe we should do that. Maybe we should do a general strike right now. I don't know. It's something we ought to be thinking about, though. Steve says, my boss thinks the virus is meant to kill off people on Social Security so they don't have to pay them. Steve says, I'm not that cynical, but pretty close. K says, I think he might be right on that, Steve. Hi, Deborah. And Deborah Wilson's checked in. And Stephanie said, sad thing is Trump seems PPP. And Matt says, Joe, under existing law, can Congress just order to f the Fed to appropriate uh, the amount in the Treasury's account? If so, why go the route okay, of minting the coin? Okay, I will answer that. Under existing law, uh, Congress can change the law. If Congress passes, if Congress passes, okay, an appropriations bill, and in the appropriations bill, it contains orders to the Fed to put the appropriate amount in the Treasury spending account, then that is the new law. In other words, if we're having Congress do it, then existing law isn't relevant because it's superseded by Congress's order to the Fed. So that's number one. Now, if so, why go the route okay, of minting the coin? Because to mint uh, the coin to pay for something, we only need to have the president um, give an order to the Secretary of the Treasury to mint uh, the coin. So if Congress doesn't want to order the Fed to put uh, the appropriate amount in the Treasury spending account, but we can find a president who's willing to mint uh, the coin, uh, then it would be possible for the president uh, to actually facilitate that. But you still might ask, well, why does uh, the Jayapal Tlaib Act, why does that um, actually specify that we ought to pay for uh, the ABC Act or the appropriations uh, that are in the uh, the ABC Act um, but by minting a few trillion dollar coins. And the reason for that is because uh, the people proposing that thought that that kind of bill would be more palatable than just including language in an appropriations bill which would order the Fed to top up the Treasury spending account. Okay. In other words, uh, the ABC um, Act was constructed in the way it was um, 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 out of a political calculation that the minting of the coin would be a more attractive or acceptable alternative to people, they would more easily understand what minting the coin was about. And also the people who wrote uh, uh, that bill, not simply Tlaib, but also her advisors, okay, Rowan Gray uh, uh, in particular, uh, the MMT advisor on this, uh, to Rashida, uh, uh, contended um, 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 successfully that if the coin could be minted, if the bill could be passed 
and the coin was minted, that would demonstrate um, to people that uh, it, under existing law, uh, the Treasury Department uh, itself had the authority to mint coins and spend appropriations through the minting of, of coins, and that would prove to people that there was no need to issue debt instruments anymore except for specific purposes. In other words, it would specifically indicate uh, to people that uh, the national debt is not really a problem because it can always be defeated by minting platinum coins. So that was the reasoning behind this, Matt. It's a very good question, and that's the answer. Steve says, Trump is an idiot. Biden is a rapist with the dementia. We are quite screwed. If we sit here and take it, we are quite screwed. We shouldn't sit here and take it. We should do everything possible to stop this from happening. Stephanie said, sad thing, Trump realizes a bit about uh, MMT. Every once in a while he has a glimmer. He, he heard or read probably at the time of the 2012-2013 crisis. He probably heard about the platinum coin. He probably heard that it was possible for the government to simply print money. He knew that. Then his advisors okay, at the Federal Reserve told him, no, that's wrong, no, that's wrong. And so maybe he had some doubts about it, or maybe he decided he would look silly if he said that anymore, so he stopped saying it. But somewhere in that broken mind of his, I know Trump still believes that. And what he believes about that is true. Stephanie says, we cannot go broke, Jesus. It isn't uh, rocket science. No, it's the Constitution. Article 1, Section 8. Congress has the power to coin money. That power is unlimited in Section 8 of the Constitution. There are no limits on it. That's not even MMT, Stephanie. It's constitutional law. Stephanie said the people making these decisions know about uh, MMT. Not all the people making these decisions, not all the Congress people, and Avril says, we'll never get anywhere until someone like Kelton runs for president. And Steve says, IKR, it's not like there's any inflation. Jim, and it's not likely there's going to be inflation in the current situation as long as the supply chains remain intact. Jim says they went on vacation when the country needed them the most. That would be akin to going on action just after on vacation, just after some country bombed Pearl Harbor and blew up half your Navy. Days in Congress, yeah, that's what's happening. Do we have any federal, federal politicians who talk honestly about how government finance actually works? Well, Rashida Tlaib um, um, authored that bill. So she's been told how it actually works. And she has to know it by now. And also, most likely, Pramila Jayapal knows about it too, because she's a co-sponsor of that bill, and they probably went through the rationale with her. So she probably knows it quite well as well. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez knows about it. I'm absolutely sure of that. Because uh, Stephanie has advised her, and one of her close friends and advisors on her campaign um, um, is an mmt -er who is studying under Stephanie right now. So Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is well acquainted with MMT by now, I believe. I believe Bernie Sanders is acquainted with um, MMT, but he doesn't want to educate uh, the public about it. He thinks it would be too long a pull to educate the public. 
cases. Not that I know of Matthew, except maybe Bernie. Rowan said on status quo, the debt ceiling has been taken out of the picture until next year. Can't remember which month. Yeah, he's right. It has been taken out of the picture until next year. But next year, it's going to come back, of course. So, it won't be out of the picture then. And Steve Wolfbrand said, how long can we live on $1,200? Half a month. Lana said, did you see Rowan's complete uh, interview? How was it? Um, I missed it. It was on Status Quo today. I was able to see a part of it. I wasn't able to see the complete interview for reasons that okay, I stated earlier. In the part I saw, Rowan did a very good job. Avril says the economy is running out of food. What good is more food stamps when you can only buy food? Uh, and Lana says outstanding. And Stephanie says thank you so much, Dr. Joe. And Lana says it's on your, all of our pages, create uh, um, an event. K says if they would expand Social Security and give us Medicare for all, they could cut fruit, the food stamps and other things. Just give me enough to have a life. Steve says, why aren't uh, uh, the millennials uh, rising up? K says, some are, Steve. K, but not enough yet. Matt says, I cringe every time I hear free market. Almost every industry is dominated by monopolies or cartels who have captured the regulatory agencies, the lawmakers, etc. They're not free, not competitive. Absolutely, and they scream free market all the time. And what they mean by free market is, leave us alone. Let us dominate our industries. The only time we want to see you, government people, is when we need to be bailed out. That's all. Other than that, just leave us alone to do our thing. Let's say fair, let's say fair. Until we fail, then come in and bail us out. That is known as lemon socialism, folks. K. Clark Ryan says, Our revolution is wanting to start okay, a new party. Um, Our revolution in Los Angeles has just voted to join the movement for a people's party. I just heard it okay, a little bit uh, earlier today. That is, Bernie Sanders, the L.A. chapter of Bernie Sanders' nonprofit, the Our Revolution nonprofit is moving over to the movement for a People's Party. Avo says, "I don't don't think they get um, MMT either, do they? Who's they?" Matt says, "We desperately need an alternative to the duopoly. We certainly do. So we need the movement for a People's Party, big time." Kay says, "I saw an hour interview with Howie Hawkins, the Green Party guy, today on Humanist Report." He sounds good, although I doubt he could win in this um, election. Lana says, the free market is a unicorn and rainbow fantasy. Uh, and the markets operate under laws where they do business. Who do those laws benefit? Who do they favor, says Lana. Okay, says, Matthew, check out the interview on the Humanist Report I saw today on YouTube. Okay. And Steve says, I saw it, not much charisma there. Okay, and Lana says, Howie seems like a decent guy, a former union activist um, 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 and Marine. He's afraid of the federal debt, though, needs... Um, ESIN knowledge, not sure what that is, but that's probably a typo. Stephanie said, I would love to have a president, a presidential hopeful who knows about MMT. The Greens don't seem to get it, could be wrong. Anna says, the woman Howie wants for VP seems um, interesting. Who is that? And Steve says, and Howie is a Russia gator. Yes, she Kay says, yes, she does, Lana. And Matt says, I know. I think back on my undergrad at econ classes. The models were so divorced from how the world actually works. 
Yet, they use mathematics and pretend they have the rigor of physics. It is so silly. It is, as you imply, propaganda for the oligarchy. Yes, it is. And Steve says, I prefer Dario Hunter. Or if what I've seen, I prefer Dario, too. And Matt Arado is addressed by Lana Dell, says Dr. Randall Ray points out mainstream economics serves the 1%. Steve says, uh, Festivus for the rest of us. And Lana says, I have to look up uh, uh, by Dario Hunter. He does look a lot tougher than Howie Hawkins. I mean, he, what he says and the way he carries himself, the way he talks. He just seems much more charismatic than Howard Hawkins. Kay says, Lana, I like the idea she was a truck driver. I spent 15 years driving a delivery truck. Rick says, these are all temporary solutions to get us through the pandemic. Um, the progressives are not going to love some of these elements, but they're necessary stop gaps. First of all, must be rebranded as relief. The stimulus comes later. Yes, the stimulus does come later. Richard, what won't the progressives not like? Steve says, then we rose up twice and the Dems stomped them us down twice. And gives a link to DNC lawsuit of millennials. Are you talking about the Nico House uh, lawsuit? Because I think that's a good one. Avril says, Dr. Joe, your reading ability is exceptional. Is it? God. <laughs> okay, folks, I'd like to read out everything, but I'm at 1119. And so, okay, I am getting tired. I had to go. Oh, thank you, Sam. <laughs> That's a nice sticker, says Sam. So I'm going to give it maybe 10 more minutes, and then I'm going to stop there. Thank you for all the comments, though. I really appreciate them all, and also thank you all for coming. And Stephanie says, do any of the green leaders understand uh, 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 MMT? Depends on who you consider a, uh, a green leader. If you consider Rodolfo Cortez who's run for Congress now twice okay, as a green leader, then he understands MMT very well and he's for MMT. If uh, you consider uh, uh, Ken Mejia, who's also run for Congress um, on the Green Party ticket, um, he's an mmt -er as well. Uh, okay, both of them are from California. Okay. Uh, there are some other people who maybe understand the good part of MMT but disagree with it for various reasons. I certainly think they're wrong. I don't think they understand MMT um, entirely well. Or if they do understand it, I think they deliberately misconstrue it. But in any case, they have more knowledge of it okay, than most people. Uh, there are some other people who may understand it, but who are neutral about it. And they include Kevin Zeese and Margaret Flowers, okay, who were pretty high up in the Green Party um, by now. Lana says, the ticker is good. And Stephanie says, thank you, Dr. Joe, for reminding folks about the sharing and the Patreon account. And Rick says, it's like three pages, rather comprehensive. Thanks, Rick. And Steve says, how is the Biden record group uh, doing? Uh, I think it's doing pretty well, but of course it needs more. What it needs is it needs that, uh, that magic post that makes the group actually go viral. If we want to make an impact. So we got to be going in there, putting in very clever posts and hoping one of them really goes. Kay says... I was watching a YouTube video about MMT just before I came on here tonight. 
But in case says, Steve, the records keep on growing um, every day. And Lana says, dried figs have seeds. Yes, they do. And uh, also, uh, 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 James McAllister said, he's a socio-psychopath and shows no empathy. And James also said that she is Chinese um, ethnicity. Steve says, I think um, she's Japanese. And James says, uh, he's afraid, okay, of educated women. Seems to me he's afraid of women, per se, isn't he? Steve says, I was saying the Biden record seems to have grown to, I think, 240 folks. Yes, it has. And he says, maybe we need to share the group to other groups. Great idea, Stephanie. Maybe we do. James McAllis says, that, oh, this man is a fascist. I believe he is. I believe he is. I believe he's a dumber version, okay, of Mussolini. Much dumber. Stephanie says, I received my stimulus, but it didn't last long. I smashed my phone by accident. Uh, but did your phone take up the whole stimulus? Wow. Avril says, I have so many broken and split teeth, it looks like I'm chewing on lit firecrackers. I was hoping for Bernie, too. Stephanie says, despite how today is going, I hope all the mothers had a good Mother's Day yesterday. Avro says, Dr. Joe, your reading ability is exceptional. Thank you, Avro. And um, Evelina Punt says, hashtag still Sanders. <laughs> and Nikki says, um, exactly, his campaign must be destroyed. And Steve says, Biden still be hiding. And Avro says, if I get that 1200 I can buy a good device to join the anti-Biden group. Kay says, Independent Party would be great for Bernie. Yes, it would. And the Progressive Party would probably be great for Bernie. And I says, I don't think Bernie will do that as much as we want him to. Yeah, I agree. But if we don't get out there and want it real bad, and call for it real bad, and insist on it real bad, then he's certainly not going to do it. Steve says, uh, you can go online and check the status of your stimulus check. Mm -hmm. Yes, you can. Kay says, many people change to Dem just to vote for Bernie. Um, independents outnumber Dems. Yes, by a considerable amount now, by something like 14 points. I think 43% are independent now, and um, but 29% are okay, Democrats. And that number, I think, is now falling. Stephanie says, some of my comments were horrible. I'm using talk to test. It's making me sound illiterate. Steve says, nah. Okay, says, you're good, Stephanie. Russ says, I need to turn in. See you again soon. Thank you, Russ. Avril says, speaking of coins, the conspiracy looms are going psycho over the 2020 quarter, having a bat on the back. We really need mental health care in this nation. Too many people are cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. What happens if the trillion-dollar coin falls behind the cushions of a sofa? Ha-ha! <laughs> Don't worry. It's not going to fall behind the cushion of a sofa. <laughs> Kay says, can't argue with Avro. Steve says, good night. And Dolores says, good night, Russell. And Avro says, loons correction. Avril says, then you have sore knuckles from hell rushing to dig it out. <laughs> dig out the coin in a jiffy. And uh, so James McAllister says, the debt needs to be addressed, i.e. increase in tax. James, you have it wrong. It does not need to be addressed. Or, as a political matter, okay, it needs to be addressed. But it doesn't have to be addressed uh, with an increase in taxes. doesn't have to be addressed with any more use of debt instruments if we don't want to issue them. Now, it doesn't matter if we issue them from a pure solvency point of view, but it matters from a political point of view because debt instruments bother the public. So what we ought to be doing is paying down the debt instruments as they fall as due, and slowly getting rid of the debt over 30 years' time. We can do that in one of two ways. We can mint um, platinum coins to cover the repayment okay, of debt 
and the payment of interest uh, on, on, on the debt. And the other thing that we can do is Congress can use what I call overt congressional financing to both uh, uh, get the Federal Reserve to top up the Treasury spending account to spend appropriations and also to repay the portion of the national debt and the interest due that is due in any given fiscal year. Uh, I have a number of blogs on that subject on my website, which you can go to. It's at josephmfirestone.com. I lay it all out there. I've laid it out in many live streams also, but okay, if you want to go there after the show, okay, to, uh, but take a look at that. You will see how the debt should be addressed without having to tax, okay, in order to address it. In fact, the tax, okay, in order to address it, is going to kill the economy. We shouldn't be doing that. And James says Amazon and other companies pay zero in tax. I, as a school teacher, pay two sixty-seven. Um, Evelina says what debt? And James is talking about uh, uh, the national debt. And he says alias is fair. And then he says uh, less a fair. Yes. There's a fair. <laughs> James, two different things, taxes and federal debt. And Avril says, and wasps. And James says they are intertwined. Not really, James, and not necessarily. And my daughter Devorah is here, I honey, and she says, Dario Hunter is a bit careless with his language. I like most of his ideas, but I'm not sure he's ready. I don't think Howie Hawkins is ready either, Devorah. I really don't. I think, I think the Green Party would do better to nominate... Uh, Rodolfo Cortez <laughs> than either Howie Hawkins or Dario Hunter. James says, um, um, I have degrees in economics and finance. So yes, they are. If you got uh, your degrees from a neoclassical okay, or neoliberal uh, 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 economics department, then they don't count. They were teaching you the wrong things, James. I'm sorry, but that's the truth of it. Um, Avril Mano says they're stubborn about it. Steph says good night. Thank you for coming, Steph. Thank you for sharing. Uh, um, also, Gloria says thank you. Good night, Stephanie says good night. All love you guys. Kay says, night, great discussion. I'll see you soon. Stay safe and well. And Lana says, what happens to James McAllister? He figures we're all crazy, so he left, probably. Okay, and Lana says, thank you and good night. And Stephanie says, thank you, Dr. Joe, for answering my questions. Sure. Lana says, we need to post from the group to our own pages and elsewhere with the hashtag Biden record hashtag. We do. Stephanie says, thank you, Dr. Joe going into my Green Party question and Avril says, I have been but not getting good results. Even he says, thanks Dr. Joe for all you do explaining and Stephanie says, my phone took up 500 of the check. My other bills have taken a lot of the rest of the check. Uh, how can your phone take up so much money, Steph? Um, find a company that you can pay like $35 a month uh, for unlimited calls and no data charges, Steph. There are phone companies out there like that. So you never have to pay a $500 phone bill again. Deborah says, I didn't say anything, but was here for a while and loved it. Going to go, night all. Thank you for coming, Deborah. Avril says, great. 
then you won't mind um, operational monetary knowledge and hashtag learn MMT. Steve says, we believe this stock money group, the Big Den, Ten Project, the Big Ten uh, um, 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 Project illegally spent nearly five million to destroy Bernie Sanders' campaign. Its director said he created the group after being approached by wealthy donors concerned about Sanders' rise. Well, it might have been that they illegally spent five million to destroy Bernie's campaign, but the amount that Bernie collected dwarfs that five million. I mean, Bernie collected at least ninety-five million dollars by my count during his um, um, campaign. So it shouldn't have been a problem to outspend them. And by the way, if he had asked for more money at that point when they were putting in the five million we would gladly have given him another $5 million. It wouldn't have been a problem. Avril Mano says federal taxes don't fund anything. Absolutely right. See Stephanie Kelton's 1999 paper for that. And uh, Stephanie smith Udy says, good night for really realist time. Laugh out loud, sweet dreams, loves. Avril Mano says, well, You've got to learn heterodox economics. Steve says, you give them your checking account. They'll drop the money in about a week. Otherwise, it could take months. Great program again. Thanks much. Sweet dream. She had to buy a new phone. I don't have one. Need hard copy. <laughs> okay, guys, I got to the end. And now I'm going to say good night. I'm going to remind you one more time. One more time. <laughs> there goes my ticker again. Patreon.com, Joe Firestone. Please share, like, and subscribe. And remember, my Patreon link is patreon.com uh, front slash Joe underscore Firestone. So, thank you all very much once again for coming. Thank you for staying. I see there's still 13 of you here, 12 of you here. That's wonderful. I'm ending the broadcast. I'll see you tomorrow night. With Ara Bloss and a special event. <laughs>